How's it going, guys? Awesome Mayo here. You know, we did a quick class to follow up on one of the copywriting. It was a class on copywriting for real estate investors, and it got a little weird. While we were doing this, while we were recording, the video and the audio went out, and so my screen was black, and I had to make a few corrections that were handed to me while we were recording. And then it turns out that the some of it was recording, so a lot of that was caught on, and then we had to go back and edit it out, and we ended up with this really long class, and some of the sessions were out of order. It was kind of a mess. We, we, we were going to redo it, but then I decided, you know, we got a lot of great feedback on this, so we just gave this to Chloe. She edited this class up and put it uh, back in order. I just said, make sure it sounds good. You know, go through it and make sure it sounds good. And for those of you that have gone through it, the completed version, you gave us a lot of great feedback, which we appreciate so much. Thank you so much. So that is what this is. But if there's a little bit of weirdness, that's why I'm just warning you uh, beforehand. That's why that happened. Okay. So here's the class. It's a lot of good stuff. Uh, you know, we're going to go over some really cool stuff. Uh, the $27 million letter, going to show you how you can get that for free. A couple other copywriting uh, lessons that from a very powerful letter that Reader's Digest just used. We're going to talk about Linda. Linda's doing some amazing things here, turning less than $7,000 into over $200,000, doing that with regularity, month after month, quarter after quarter. A lot of real cool stuff, so it's all coming up right now. I hope you guys really enjoy this class, and as always, please let us know what you think about it. All right, so here's the class. This is a quick follow-up to a recent story we did on a famous piece of copywriting. Some of you have been telling me about how much you enjoy the stuff on copywriting for real estate investors, so I'm making this uh, special class here, this special uh, quick video here, and if you like, if you want us to do stuff like this, then we can do more of it. Okay, so this is copywriting for real estate investors, how Reader's Digest went from 4 million subscribers to over 12 million subscribers and what this secret holds for real estate investors who can copy and paste this success. Also, how a teacher turns $2,500 into thirty-five grand three times in less than 90 days as a real estate investor, as a brand new real estate investor, I should say. $2,500 into thirty-five grand, doing that three times in less than 90 days, all using the same secret, the same technique. It's like I've said so many times before, people wanting to get in real estate or wanting to get to business in general, not just real estate investors, but business owners, entrepreneurs. I've said this over and over again over the years. When I say that learning to use the phone and gaining compliance is the difference between success and failure, man, it is completely true. And I see this every day because compliance, you know, the skill, you know, talking people into doing stuff is the only business skill in the world that if you learn to do that well enough, you never really need to learn to do anything else. It's a great skill to have. So let's take a look at how these guys went from failing and down to like 4 million subscribers all the way back up 12 million subscribers. So back in 1948, Reader's Digest was losing their base of subscribers. They'd gone from over 6 million to about 4.5 million and they were dropping every month. Things were looking bad, really bad. So they hired a copywriter named Walter Weiss. Now, he was good at what he did, but he was about to do something gangster that would cement his status as a legend. So Walter had a crazy, crazy idea to promote Reader's Digest. To get new subscriptions, he wasn't just going to write a letter, a great letter, by the way. It was a really good letter. But on top of that, he was also going to attach two pennies to the letter that would be visible from the outside side of the envelope. So as soon as you got it, you could see the two penny. And he also included a teaser on the front, some teaser copy on the front of the envelope that could be read from the outside. It was right beneath the pennies and the teaser read. So you would get this in the mail. You'd see the two pennies. These are actual real pennies that they used. You could see them from the outside and then you'd see the words, if thou hast two pennies beneath it. So that was the outside of the letter. And in a second, I'll show you the inside, the actual letter in a second. But first you should know just how successful this letter was, just how powerful what you're about to see was. And actually you're already looking at a big ingredient of the poll that, you know, using these two pennies on the outside. But to really get an idea of how powerful this was, Reader's Digest would go on to use over 100 million pennies at one time. That's 100 million pennies at one time. And one of the first problems they had is that there weren't enough pennies in the area, in the New York State area. So they had to ship them in from all over the country and then even have them printed by the U.S. Mint and sent to New York. They had so many pennies coming in from all over the place that they had a special storage in a warehouse to hold all these pennies. But as the pennies added up, the weight of the pennies was too much and the floor actually collapsed under the weight of the pennies. And it was a lot of work to deal with these pennies. And this is why so many people thought this was a terrible idea because there were so many complications that came from getting all these pennies together. And on the surface, it really did seem like to a lot of people that this was going to be a disaster, but obviously it wasn't. In fact, of all the pieces that Walter had written, this wasn't just a top performer for him. It's not just one of the best letters he's ever written, but it's been one of the most successful marketing letters of all time ever written by anybody. And Walter was a pioneer in creating what they call tokens at that time. Now we call it like lumpy mail. 3D mail, where you mail something physical with the letter. In this case, it was two pennies. Using an item like this helps in getting attention, getting the piece open, and as we can tell you, and anybody who's ever tested any of this can tell you, ask anybody who sends a lot of mail like us, it can have a massive, massive increase in response rate and conversions. You use the same letter, and if you're making any kind of money on it or having any kind of compliance, start adding just the right item, and you can double, triple, quadruple your business overnight. And Walter was one of the leaders in this innovation. Also, something else about this piece. Whenever you send letters out or you do any kind of large 
charge mailing, something that always happens is that mail gets returned or undeliverable. And in this case, the letter was so successful, there were so many mailers sent, so many millions and millions of packages sent, that the undeliverable and returned mail really started stacking up. Now normally this wouldn't be a big deal, but in this case, in the packages, each of them had money, right? Like two pennies, they had money in there. There were pennies in these envelopes, in these unopened envelopes. And when Reader's Digest got the mail back, they didn't know exactly what to do with it because it was costing, it was already costing so much money to send the mailers out and to store the pennies. And then when they had to pay for the return mail, it was costing them extra to pay to get all this, you know, undeliverable mail sent back to them. Now normally they would just throw those envelopes away, but there was money in them. But then they figured out in order to open each envelope, they'd have to pay people to do that. And that would cost even more money. So they told the post office, please don't mail us back these envelopes, these undeliverables, just, you know, it's just too expensive. So just destroy the envelopes. But the post office responded by saying that it was a federal crime to destroy money. So they had to send it back. And now Reader's Digest had an even bigger problem because now they couldn't destroy the packages either because that would be a federal crime, you know, destroying the money. And when they calculated uh, based on how many packages they got, they calculated that if they hired people and made the space and time available, it would cost about four cents to open each envelope and get the two cents out. So they would lose even more money. So as time went on, this became like a real problem. You know, what do we do with all these unopened envelopes with pennies that have money in them? And that is another piece of brilliance in this story. To deal with these returned envelopes, a very enterprising young man at Reader's Digest partnered with a local boys club. They had the boys spend the countless hours opening each envelope and taking out the pennies and sending half of the pennies back to Reader's Digest, who then used them in the next mailings. They used the pennies that they got sent back. Now the deal with the boys club was that for every penny the boys club sent to Reader's Digest, the boys club organization got to keep a penny. A win-win, right? And with all those pennies that the boys club was able to get, they actually went out and purchased a new building. So it's a great solution. So it's always been one of my favorite parts of the story. It's what a great solution, right? Okay, so let's talk about this letter. As soon as you got it, you'd see the two pennies on the front and you'd read the text. If thou hast two pennies, then once you opened and read the letter, this is what you saw. So you see the headline, the best reading pleasure for the next 12 months, but let's look at how the letters start. Dear reader, an ancient Persian poet said, if thou hast two pennies, spend one for bread with the other by hyacinths for thy soul. Poetry perhaps, but hard sense as well. Okay, I'll stop right there and just point out a couple of things, a couple of lessons to take away from this already. First, the immediate mention of the penny, and this is so important. A lot of amateurs that I've worked with will get the idea in their head of sending, you know, like a pencil or glasses or even pennies. And I did this too when I first started, just to send something. And a lot of amateurs still do this. They'll send something in their letters to get attention, but they won't make a clear, logical connection between, you know, what was sent, what was attached to the letter, and the reason for the letter itself. And I'll tell you that in every single case, when you make a logical, clear connection, you will always have a higher response and a higher conversion on the mailing. So in the Reader's Digest letter, in this Reader's Digest letter, there's an immediate mention of the significance. So that's the first lesson, the mention of the token, the immediate connection between the attached item and the letter or the piece itself. And the second lesson is to open with a famous quote. Quotes are always a good way to open, you know, anything from a speech, a letter, or even just a conversation. Quotes are just brilliant. They're amazing, especially famous ones. Proven way to win arguments, state your point with an endorsement, or even just make people laugh. Quotes are awesome. If you're ever stuck in your writing, just start looking up quotes. So those are the first uh, first immediate things that jump out. Now I'm going to read the rest of the letter nonstop. So I'm just going to read it through it and just watch how brilliantly Walter merges the concepts. You know, there's a lot happening here in just this one page and a few short paragraphs. This is real brilliant syllogism. So I'll read it. I'll read it all. I won't stop again, but just as you listen and as you read it, as you read along, just see what jumps out at you. All right. Poetry perhaps, but hard sense as well. To buy hyacinths for the soul, to nourish your mind and heart with good reading, to become informed, alert, interesting in what you say to others is just as important as progress in your business or social life. And it needn't be a task. One compact little magazine, 12 times a year, will stave off mental stagnation, give you something worthwhile to think about and talk about, keep you from being bored and boring. That magazine is the Reader's Digest. So here, with our compliments, are two pennies for you. We invite you to keep one as your change, and with the other penny, seal the bargain for the finest, highest sense you can find anywhere. The next 12 issues of the Reader's Digest. Just slip one penny into the pocket in the enclosed card and mail today. We'll send you the next 12 issues of the Digest, worth $4, but we'll send you a statement for only $2.01. Thus, you will get 12 issues for the price of six, and you get your change in advance. This invitation cannot be extended again for at least two years. 
Therefore, we urge you to act at once. And then there's the signature line. Now, that's that's pretty good, right? It's good stuff. Okay, so let's break this down and look into a little bit more. All right, so I already pointed out and mentioned the use of the penny or the token, the uh, you know the the item, and I also pointed out the mention of the quote. But also, did you notice the brilliant use of these two pennies that were included in the mailing? The brilliant use of this: keep one is your change, and the other penny you send back to them. This isn't just mentioning the item and tying the item in with the message, but the item is also being included. The token is part of the response mechanism. You saw how that worked? Brilliant stuff. This is really powerful stuff. And one of the reasons, you know, back in these old letters, they didn't have time or space or budget for pictures. And when we talk about pictures and using images and stuff like that, with the internet, it's totally different. Obviously, you don't have that same cost, but you really want to be careful. Again, building your skill without pictures, make sure that when you do use pictures, you use them skillfully. And I'll cover that in a, in a future uh, class on copywriting, but we've covered the basics on that. Whenever you use an image, always make sure you use a caption because captions have really high readership. Sometimes that's the first thing people will read and sometimes the only thing they'll read. So it's worth putting an image if you can afford it, if you're doing print and on the internet, you can always afford it. But when you do an image, sometimes it makes sense to do the image just for the caption. So make sure the caption is good. Also, when you use an image and you use a model or maybe it's you, always have them looking towards, towards the copy, never away. They're looking towards the copy, usually looking or pointing upward or downward at a 45 degree angle. You don't want to be pointing and looking straight at the camera. If you're pointing or even if you're not pointing, you always be looking up or down at a 45 degree angle and look at a headline. The reason is because people always look where other people look. So you want people looking at your headline. But I digress. There's no images here. I'm just saying that when you don't have those images and you don't have the use of doing that stuff, you've got to be even better. So they used the pennies as part of the response mechanism. Also, they included the enclosed card. So they provided the actual delivery vehicle or the response vehicle. Make it easy to order. Always think about Disney. One entry, one exit, right? Make it easy and almost necessary to order and buy something. And the last thing I'll point out here is the brilliant verbiage Walter used to describe the intellectual benefits. Notice the use of action words. Verbs over adjectives. It's it's such a good rule to follow. It's a golden rule to follow. So it's nourish your mind and heart with good reading. To become informed, alert, interested in what you say to others is just as important progress in your business or social life. And then in the next paragraph, he uses the publication in a really interesting way. He weaponizes the magazine as an antidote. It will, I'll quote here, it will stave off mental stagnation, give you something worthwhile to think about and talk about, keep you from being bored and boring. It caters to a, you know, a basic human need in all of us. So often when we're talking to people we want something new to say you know it's like chris rock said when couples are together too long they'll be like why don't you get some new stuff to talk about go get kidnapped or something you know people are so scared of being bored that's one thing but they're also even more terrified of being boring to other people and people that they meet so it's a great way to weaponize the publication okay so as always there's lots of lessons from this copy and the way it was used and like i said below is a copy of the actual piece and the envelope or you can send me an email if you don't see it or you don't get it i'll make sure you get one it's brilliant stuff it's really really uh very very uh very smart smart, very smart use of verbiage here, very smart use of words and compliance. And as always, you want to make sure that you are extracting, delivering, and replicating brilliance in all your work. Now, how can you apply this? When it comes to the MFM or the manufactured franchise model, and if you don't know what that is, you want to go through the class on that because it's, you know, a lot of great stuff there. But in this case of using this uh, letter specifically, we've modeled several different letters and campaigns after this one example. In one case, we sent a penny in a see-through envelope, and on the outside, the tease was, this penny can get you out of foreclosure. This was a mailing to home homeowners in foreclosure, obviously. And in the letter, I explained that I was hosting a special workshop for homeowners uh, that were in foreclosure and the cost of attending was just bringing the penny in. That would be their admission instead of paying the normal $300 or whatever. And we used some of the same elements in that letter, the mention of the token, the use of it as the response mechanism, providing the vehicle, etc. But here's the thing with that letter. I would not suggest doing that letter that way because although it did kick up our response and the returns that we got, the, the ROI, there were people who did get offended, who did not like it. They were upset that their mailman or somebody else, some other person outside their immediate family would see that they were in foreclosure. Or maybe some people in their immediate family that they didn't want to see, they didn't want them to know that they were in foreclosure. And so we did get some complaints. And this is the kind of stuff that you learn when you're out there in the trenches. I was quite young when I wrote that and I didn't even think about that at the time. Now I would I would know how embarrassing that can be. At the time I wasn't thinking like that. And I know some people will hear what I just said and say, who cares? Screw them. You know, they're a bunch of deadbeats and losers that can't pay their bills. And those people have a lot to learn and you will eventually grow empathy
empathy and mature to a level where you have more understanding for people in diverse situations. And I, um, it's quite embarrassing that there are people who are on my list or among my base that will think like that. But it's true. Some people would think like that. I, the way I was trained when I first started was to think kind of like that. This is when I was doing the Wall Street stuff. But I've grown since then. And if you are still back in that mentality, you do not have my permission to be like that. I'm willing to share this stuff with you guys, but do, you know, do good stuff with it. Don't be mean, please. For me, we stopped doing it because uh, if we, even if we got a higher compliance or we made more money, it's not worth it if we're making people feel bad. People in foreclosure, and this is very important, if you're losing your home, your house, this is, you know, where you live. If you're losing that, then it's easy to think that life sucks. You're probably not in the mood to, you know, go hopping through the meadow catching butterflies. And I don't want to add to your misery. You shouldn't want to either. Be very sensitive of this stuff. I want to make people feel good, not bad, you know, and I recommend that you adopt that same mentality. You don't have to be mean or nasty and you don't have to be offensive to make your point. And if you do think that you have to be offensive to make your point, then you need to get better at making your point. I know that lately it seems like some people, you know, they have this idea in their head that treating people ugly is cool and they think that if they're mean to people, it proves how tough they are. All that is nonsense. And on a long enough timeline, we all learn that lesson. So just be nice always. It always helps. So we stopped using that teaser and we found a better way to do it. After some testing, we found a way that even beat that way. And I'm going to talk about that in a second, but I bring it up just so you get the idea that, you know, always stay conscious and always be thinking about how you make people feel. You should be in business to help people and to lift people up. No need to make anybody feel bad or make them think that you're having a go at them or you're raking them over the coals or you're taking shots at them. Just be nice. It always pays off. I hope that sounds like common sense. When I was doing the real estate seminar stuff, I don't do that anymore. But when I was going around, I was amazed at how many people, how many like real estate gurus who were quite successful at being gurus would get up and say that the biggest problem you have in your life is that you're too nice. You're just too damn nice. And I would see people in the audience like nodding their heads and taking notes. And I'd always think, well, what are you writing down? Like writing nice and then putting a circle and a slash through it. Like, what are you thinking? That is not advice to follow. Don't listen to people like that. I made that mistake when I started off in my Wall Street days. And it's some of the worst stuff I've ever done in my life, except for the stuff that I used to do to animals. I was, you know, part of a slaughterhouse and uh, ugly stuff there. But as far as stuff to people, uh, that's probably the worst stuff I did when I did the Wall Street stuff. I was trained like that. And one of the biggest, you know, one of the most influential people in my life was Margaret when she taught me that you can actually be nice, be cool and helpful and get rich at the same time. So I really hope I'm not the first person to tell you that. But just, you know, if I am, just know, just be nice, you know, be nice. Yes, being a nice guy. Nice guys don't finish last. On a long enough timeline, they always finish first. And anytime somebody will bring up an example of somebody who's not nice, this guy at work or so-and-so or this person or that person, and they're doing great, just just wait. The movie's not over. Be nice. Be helpful. Lift people up. Always be thinking about the way you make people feel. I would have loved if somebody taught me that earlier. There's almost no greater measure of your life and your business than the way you make people feel. So always be thinking about that. Okay, so in another iteration of that same letter and a better pulling version, we use the same penny. And we tested other coins too, like nickels and dimes and quarters and sometimes half dollars. But in one pulling, in one case that we did that pulled really well was a quarter. And the teaser said, I will trade you this quarter for $100 cash. And then I explained that I'm doing this class, this foreclosure class, and if you bring the quarter in as the cost of admission, and at the end of the class, if I haven't shown you at least five ways to escape foreclosure, stop the process dead in its tracks, and totally turn around the financial hellhole that you found yourself in, then you march right up to me, stop your feet, and throw the quarter in my face, and I will gladly give you a heartfelt apology and put a fresh $100 bill in your hands, a fresh, crisp $100 bill in your hands. Now, those are the actual words that I use. Notice the verbs here and the imagery. The more you use verbs and nouns and not adjectives, the more you create a mental picture. You have this mental picture in your head just because the words I used, right? Specifically the verbs. And that's exactly what you want people to, the, the effect you want to have, that you put an image in their head. And especially this idea that they're walking up and throwing it in my face. You know, they want to be the judge. People want to be the judge on American Idol, the panelist who gives unworthy contestants the giant X. They want to see themselves as Caesar, you know, who controls the lives of gladiators with a simple thumbs up or thumbs down. So when you run dialogue, when you write copy, or when you talk with any of your people, always give them that control, give them that power. And one way to do this is to dramatize their potential reactions. Go to the extremes of pain and pleasure, especially when it's at your expense. Self-deprecation always works. You'll see what I mean in a second when we talk about testimonials. And you know, by the way, I should cover this real quick. If you're doubting this idea of self-deprecation and it doesn't work or people wanting to have that feeling, that sensation of superiority over you, I'll tell you a quick story. This is kind of a big secret that I don't think I've ever shared in a venue like this, you know, in, in, in a way like this before. I've only shared it like in non-recorded sessions. This is kind of a big secret that I haven't really shared, uh, 
uh, publicly like this before, but I'll tell you this because it's been a very profitable little thing. So I've always been into like martial arts and boxing and stuff, but the reason I got into that stuff is not because I'm some big tough guy. It's like the exact opposite. I got so sick of being bullied and beat up. And that's one of the reasons why I excelled at it because I had a lot of fear. I had a lot of, you know, a lot of accountability. But as I got better, I got really enthusiastic into the art style of it, you know, the technique and the form and stuff. And it's why, you know, being so enthusiastic about it is why I got asked by a lot of good teachers to be their assistants. And then eventually I was a teacher myself. And that's why I got into training and I got some of the amazing opportunities and requests to train law enforcement and military personnel and stuff like that. Especially when I was doing my work with in the intelligence world, a lot of the downtime that I had, I was doing that kind of stuff. And it wasn't because I was so skilled at the physical part of it, but it was for other reasons. You know, I was enthusiastic. Basically, the real secret, honestly, is that in many ways, I'm a giant puss in poots. I'm really not this tough guy. Although looking at my resume, it may seem the opposite. That's not the case. And one of the reasons I was asked and requested to teach and to train people is because, um, you know, I don't have that persona. And people find that out once they get to know me. But when I was starting out, one of the first things I realized, if you really want to get better and you want to get better quickly, one way, you know, I used to just always have this fear, you know. But the, the thing of it is, is that deep down, especially when I was starting, I was younger and I wasn't as skilled. I was always just so scared. I always had that, 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 you know, that feeling in my stomach, that pit, you know, that deep pit in the, you know, that deep like sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, you know, it's like a deep feeling. I always had that. And one of the ways that I found out to deal with it was that anytime I went to a gym, if anybody ever asked me to spar or to fight or anything before even thinking, I would always say yes, without even thinking about it. You just got to say yes, say yes. I, I teach this now all the time. It's one of the first things I teach people. If you're ever at any class that I'm training, doesn't matter whether it's, you know, civilian or military or law enforcement or whatever, one of our rules is always yes. The answer is yes, yes, yes. Doesn't matter if they're 10 times bigger than you or if they're, you know, you're a woman and he's a man or, you know, man, woman, whatever. It doesn't matter. The answer is always yes. You got to get over that fear because you never, especially if you're on the streets or, you know, if you're in a war zone, you never know. You're not going to, no one's going to be like, oh, let me not go shoot that guy or run at that guy with a knife. He's too small or too big or it's a woman or whatever. No one thinks that, you know, so you got to be ready to fight at any moment. And it's how I got over my fears. You know, anytime someone asked me anything, I always said, yes, yes, yes. I just, I, in my mind, I would say, don't even think about it. Just say yes. The answer is always yes. And so it's not just what I did, but it's the advice I give everyone that I've trained. Don't think about it because then you'll look around, you know, you'll see the guy, you'll, you know, look at him and, you know, look at his muscles. You'll see how big he is. Or, you know, maybe you saw him sparring before and, you know, he's really good. You'll start measuring him up or whatever. You'll wonder how experienced he is. And then you'll just, you know, you keep, you just forget. No, you can't get into that stuff. Forget all of that stuff. Just say yes. And that's the only way you'll get better. Because then when you walk into a gym, you won't even look around. You won't get nervous. Just say, you know what? <laughs> you know, I'm going to fight everyone here. Fight everybody. Spar everybody. And then learn from each round. Learn from each engagement. And when you take that attitude, people will not just beat you up. I mean, you will get some of that. But when they know that you really want to learn, they'll start telling you what your weaknesses are. And you'll get a lot better really quickly. So anytime somebody asked me to spar, I always said yes. And that wouldn't be so bad if I went to like, you know, professional places. But another thing that I always suggest if you really want to get better is don't go to pretty places. If they have air conditioning or a sauna or, you know, they make you sign a legal waiver or some kind of release, then do not go there. They won't push you enough for you to get much better. Instead, you're a lot better going off to a gym that's like some guy's neighbor's garage. That's where you want to be. You won't see a nice, neat row of treadmills. Instead, you're going to see, you know, a row of pit bulls. That's what you want to think. Think like Ali, old school Ali. It'll be a mess, but if you survive it, you'll be a much better fighter, a much more experienced person. And that feeling that I described, that pit in your stomach, you will get rid of that real quick. It's places like that where you really learn to fight. And more importantly, the mentality that it takes to, you know, to, to keep your cool when you really are screaming inside. So I was at a place like that working out and I was about to finish up after a long and heavy workout. And uh, for the past few days, there was this girl there and she was really excited. And, you know, she had been coming there every day. And I asked her why she was so excited. She said, my man, just got home. And I thought that she meant that she was there every day because he kept getting home from work around that time. But what she really meant was that he just got out of jail, out of prison. He had just made parole and he'd been locked up for assault and battery and he had a few burglaries and other stuff. Well, he was in and out of trouble for years. But now finally he had come home. He was there for a few days. He'd been back for a few days or a few weeks. And she was there because, you know, when he was in jail or when he was uh, locked up, he was boxing every day and lifting weights and fighting and stuff. And he was the boxing champ of his cell block. So every day for like the past five years, or so he had been boxing and brawling you know rapists and murderers and like seriously violent criminals you know he was just and he was beating them up he was winning so that's that's who was you know who my workout buddy was right so this day I was getting ready to leave and the trainer walks up to me and he says hey you want to spar a couple rounds with a new guy and <laughs> as soon as he said that I knew who he was talking about I just knew it I, I knew I, I didn't even need a look I knew it and I thought oh man everything in my body was screaming no no you just finished working out no don't do this but I Again, I had to follow my rule. It is so ingrained.
reminded me that before I had a chance to do what I really wanted to do and say no and scream or run away or say, you know what, I got a sprained, you know, I got a stretch. Or no, I didn't have a chance to do any of that. Before I had a chance to think or say anything remotely rational, out of my mouth came the word, yeah. And that was it. It's that quick. You got to be like, yeah, yes, you just got to do it. That's how you got to respond. So yeah, let's do it. That's what I said. And man, I knew, I knew it was going to be bad. So there I was, worn out, tired, and there he is, this guy. Man, this guy is huge. I know people think I'm big, but that guy, it was seriously huge. He was like 6'7", six, 6'6", six, six, something like that. Tattoos everywhere. And he had, you know, the ankle bracelet for people who are on house arrest. He had that on. And then um, before we started the fight, I remember before before we, I, we were standing across from each other getting ready to go, and then his girl yells out, hey, did you already take your meds? And right after she said that, I looked at him. You know, I was waiting for him to respond. I was waiting for him to say something like, of course I did. You know, I'm a responsible citizen with deep regard for public safety or something like that. But instead, he was jumping up and down, rolling his head in circles with his eyes closed. He was just, you know, just completely ignoring her. He's just stretching and getting ready to fight, totally ignoring the question. So I still, to this day, don't know what the answer was, but I assume based on how things went that the answer was no. He did not take his meds. And then, oh, one, one other thing. Just before the bell rang, his trainer started filming us, and then he told the trainer not to film us. Don't film this. Then the trainer asked him why. Paroli said, because my parole officer doesn't want me to be doing this. He says it's not good for my rehabilitation. So this is, this is no joke, right? This is what I'm looking at. And you know, you know, the way that I'm telling you this, the way that I'm setting this up, you might think that I fought through it, that I overcame the odds, and that I beat the guy. So the moral of the story is that if you face your fears, you always win, right? No, that's not what happened. I'm not setting you up to give you a surprise ending. The bell rang, we fought, and man, I got my ass kicked. It was bad. It was really bad. It was brutal, just savage. I got worked, man. It was just bad news bears up and down. It was bad. I got beaten badly, okay? Not ideal. Here's the thing. Even though his trainer stopped filming, the girl did not stop filming. She filmed the whole fight, if you could call it that. And when we were done, I asked her for some reason if I could get a copy. I don't I don't really know. I just knew it, well, it wasn't pretty and uh, it wasn't as bad maybe as I'm making it sound. I, I lost heavily, handedly. It wasn't even close, but I just wanted to get a copy of it. Now, here's why I'm telling you all this and here's my point. It was around that time, right after that, that I was writing a letter for business owners. This was for like restaurant chain owners, like local ones, also larger ones like Dunkin' Donuts and Subways. We used to buy them. We still do, buying and selling them, putting them into packages and buying and selling them. We do it now, but we this is when we first started doing it a lot, and we're doing it a little bit less now. But this was at a time when I was writing those letters. So we used to buy them and sell them and work with people. We also did a training program that was about twenty to $30,000, and we could help them grow their business. And so for the workshop, for that workshop of growing their business, I would probably promise that it would be the most, you know, mind-blowing, profit-generating, revenue-boosting thing that they've ever been to, and that they'd be able to sell their Subway or whatever business they had for 30% or more than it's worth right now, guaranteed. And my part of my guarantee was that if you're having problems selling it, I'll buy it for that as long as you're putting my stuff in place and growing your business with it. So it was a it was a good way to buy, you know, to buy uh, to buy restaurants, to buy Subways and Dunkin' Donuts. We talk about, you know, I tell them how they could double their revenue without selling any more donuts or selling any more food, how they could buy another Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's or whatever that was twice Twice as big as theirs with no money down, no credit checks. So, you know, I had all this stuff in my copy with all with testimonials, by the way. But then at the end of all these promises, at the end of this letter, I changed what I said a few times. But in this case, I said that if I failed to do any of that, I would not only, I mean, I obviously had a strong guarantee, but then I had, and this is a quote from the actual letter. Imagine a six and a half foot giant career criminal who spent the last half decade beating to a bloody pulp, the most violent, the most vicious criminals, gangbangers, murderers, serial killers, and bank robbers in a 500 mile radius. Then I tried to be a tough guy when I stared at down and got in the ring with him, only to be brutally taken down, unimaginably savaged, beaten, and violated worse than the most horrific alien probe. And the crazy part is, it's all on tape. <laughs> so you notice the heavy verbiage there, right? So at the end of this letter, part of my guarantee, I'm mentioning this video, and I say, you know, I make it very clear, I'm using the verbs, right? The heavy verbiage and the dramatics. That's the stuff I'm talking about when people want to see this stuff, right? So if I let these people down, I, there's any promise that I came even an inch short of in any way that I would send you this video of me getting my ass kicked basically. And so I tested that letter in combination with the other letter and it was amazing how much better this second letter did just by adding that little guarantee at the end or that little part of the guarantee. And here's what would happen. People walked up to me at this workshop that we did. They would call up. They would send us letters and faxes and voicemails. They weren't unhappy. Nobody ever was. And by the way, that's not an exaggeration. I'm putting this out, saying this out on the internet for anybody. You know, anyone can contradict this, but I'll tell you any of those people that we worked with, they were 
we're all happy. Anybody can call me out on this right now. Nobody will because it's true. Nobody was ever unhappy, unsatisfied, or felt that I underdelivered or misled them in any way. It's always important for me to point that out. I take it very seriously how you know how well we take care of our people. So none of these people, whether it's a Subway or McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts or a local place, I delivered on every promise I ever made. Overdelivered, they would say. But my point is, people would call up. Nobody was unhappy, but they just wanted to see the video. I was shocked at how many people wanted to see this video. These are people who liked me and they wanted to see this video. And so we started testing it in another campaign. I would take, I just started adding that line, that same verbiage of, you know, here's a guarantee, blah, 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 you know, the money back, all that stuff, the same guarantees ever. And then I would add this thing of me being, you know, violated worse than the most horrific alien pro part. I would add that into the end of these, these letters that we were sending out. And consistently we were getting a higher and higher response rate just by adding this little verbiage. We tested this in another campaign with buyers and we got a response rate that went from 9% to 13%, which meant over $25,000. And that was just the immediate money. The back end money was over $300,000. So if you add that up, that's over $325,000 from one campaign just for getting my ass kicked. This remains to this day, my most profitable fight ever. Not that I ever fought professionally. This is like not only my most profitable, but that I, my only profitable fight, the only fight I ever made money on. And it was like the worst fight I've ever had. My point is the reason I bring this up is because when we talk about testimonials or this idea that the person wants to feel superior, they want to be able to be like, you know, Caesar giving the thumbs up and thumbs down. And by using verbs and creating these heavy images, you know, this alien probe, this horrific alien probe, and I'm going to get beaten worse than that. And you get to see it. People love this stuff. They really respond to it. Even people who like you, $325,000 from one campaign. Over the years, it's been worth millions and millions of dollars to our team. And it doesn't even matter if it's them. They'll say, you know what, my boss man, or they'll say, you know what, a good friend of mine. And they, they bring me up in the conversation. Sometimes they'll bring me up in the letter or in a conversation just to put that little verbiage at the end of that letter because they know people always want to see it. That's how powerful this is. Don't downplay this part in all of our humanity. You know, I'm giving away a pretty powerful letter in this class, the old letter from Walter. And I'm also going to be giving another letter later in this class, but there's a bunch of other profitable and powerful stuff here that we're covering in this class. So you want to make sure you get all that stuff. But you know what? Even though I'm saying all this, of all the stuff that we're going to cover in this video, there are going to be people who walk away from this class, this video that you're watching and listening to right now. And the number one thing on their mind is they want that video of me catching a beat down. You know, that's how powerful it is. You know, if I got on the internet right now, this is a part of all of us. If I got on the internet right now and I went to every single person online, every single human being that's on the internet right now. And I said, here are two buttons. You press one and you'll see, you know, a proven way to build a portfolio of real estate and retire 20 years early. That's button one. Button number two, if you click that, you get to see a kangaroo kick me in the balls. You know, if I gave people that option over 99% of the people on the internet, you know what they want, right? You know which button they're going to push, right? They're going to be like, show me your down unders. You know, they're going to want to see that. That's what they want to see. They want to see the kangaroo kicking me in the balls. And it's okay. You can play that hand and still win big. You can play to that and still win big as long as you know what you're doing. So use these examples and watch your compliance soar. There's always ways. Okay, so here's another way to model off this. So another campaign was sent. Zach and Randall sent this campaign and that response rate by using that verbiage, again, by saying basically you're going to love it or I'll send you this video of, you know, all that stuff. Uh, that went from two to seven to eight percent and that was a net increase of $200,000. And when I'm talking about that $325,000 or this $200,000, I don't mean that that's how much the campaign made compared to, you know, making 150000 or whatever. What I'm saying is that that is all extra money. Meaning if we, when we include that, we made 325,000 extra. When they included that, they made $200,000 extra and extra money. That's how valuable that little paragraph, that little verbiage is. And like I said, you know, there are people that are watching this right now. They won't ask about the dialogue or the scripts or the compliance or the copy or any of that. They'll send us, you know, this Randall, they'll send us an email and it'll basically just say, you got a video there that there fella getting his butt whooped. That's all they want to hear. You know, I mean, there's people that will say that and it wasn't, you know, I'm not making it. it I guess it wasn't that bad, but it kind of was. I mean, I wasn't like, oh, I hope I can have kids after this. It wasn't like that bad, but it was, it was pretty bad. It was the worst beating that I've ever gotten. And, you know, keep in mind, you know, being on bases and having downtime and going at it with, you know, special forces and SEALs and Rangers and stuff like that. Even with those fights, even with those under my belt, that was still, that day was still the worst beating I ever got. So it's not like that bad, but it was pretty bad. And you can model off this, you know, we've had people that'll, you know, say, you know, I, when I've written copy for people and I've used something like this, I mentioned this and I say, do we have something like that? We'll use examples of watch me, you know, try to be a handyman and change the tire in my car when me and my wife are, you know, our tire blew out and watch me change the tire and watch her stare at me and watch me and with the look of disappointment and getting on Facebook and looking up her ex and wondering what could have been, you know, the one that got away is she's watching me fumble around, not knowing what I'm doing, that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff you want, that kind of self-deprecation where you're trying to be cool and you're not. It's like the hashtag epic fail is what the kids call it. That stuff really works.
weeks and you can milk it for years. So I've sat down with clients and we've used examples like I just said about the tire. Like I'll sit down and we go over, you know, this example, what I what I just talked about with the fight. And I'll say, do you have something like that? And maybe it'll be the tire changing like I just talked about. That was an example we've used. We've used examples of people trying to fix a computer, of people trying to, you know, teach their son or their kids a lesson. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff you've done in your life that if you milked it, if you really dramatized it and, you know, if you really explained how embarrassing it was, how humiliating it was, and you let people, you gave people the chance to see it, they would want to see it. It helps to humanize you too. It makes you more likable. Just now, the fact that I'm even mentioning and admitting that I got beat down like that makes me more likable, right? You know, whenever you say anything bad about yourself, people believe it immediately, you know? No one doubts that my house was raided, you know? what I mean, when you say that kind of stuff, it helps with your credibility. That's another secret of compliance, by the way. Anything you say about yourself should be bad. Okay, so moving on, here's another way to model off this. This is a big secret when sending any kind of direct mail. It's a version of something we've invented called a self-serve. The self-serve, we talk about this a lot. It's where you use the same pocket of consumers for both sides of a transaction. So we do this a lot with doctor's offices and medical clinics where we'll mail them and we'll say something like, do you want to sell your business? Do you want to sell your medical clinic? And then we subtract the replies and then we mail again. We, we subtract the people that said yes. Then we mail back to that exact same list and we basically say, since you don't want to sell your business or your practice, here's a list of businesses just like yours that you can buy or merge with. And then you can just broker those deals among those people, that same list of consumers. I love doing this. We all love doing this. It's really a cool way of making money. So in this case, and really one of the single biggest mistakes that people make in all their marketing and communication is that people don't use enough testimonials. In general, people in business and especially real estate investors don't understand the importance of endorsements and testimonials. And elsewhere I teach, you know, at other places I teach how to get and use killer testimonials that work every time that format the algorithm with how to come up with them and use them and how to get them and use them even if you've never been in business or done anything. There's simple ways to get this going. So I won't get into that right now. Just know that what others say about you, especially people who are most like your target in situation, background, and circumstance, people who lived and can voice the exact objections and trust barriers that your target has, those are the best people to make your argument, not you. It's them. With fight clubs, for example, I use testimonials from people who used to be really fat, just just like me. I mean, I use my own, but I also use from other people that used to be really fat. The fatter, the better, as long as they weren't fat when I was done with them. With doctors, I use testimonials from other doctors, preferably in the same field. With real estate, we use testimonials from, you know, people from all experience levels, people who just started, people who've been doing it for a while, and people who are veterans. Beginners and experts, it's important to use experts and veterans, by the way, also as testimonials, so you avoid a potential target saying, oh, I already know all that stuff, or I've heard it all before, or there's no such thing as secrets. That's why you want to use people with different, you know, think about your target, and you want to get people that fit that criteria, and think of the objections your target has, and people that can answer that with authority. And I also, by the way, with our real estate stuff, we also use uh, testimonials from people all over the world, different areas, and different markets to make it clear that that doesn't work today or that doesn't work in my area is not a reasonable question. And I know that doesn't sound like a question doesn't work in my area, but that's their way of saying a question. It's an excuse, you know, there's really with a question mark at the end and you want to get rid of that stuff as soon as possible. Testimonials help a great deal with that. Your testimonials should do the heavy lifting. My point is that you want your testimonials to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Use endorsements, recognition, and testimonials a lot more, a lot, lot, a lot more. No matter how much you're doing it now, it's not enough. It's like eating vegetables. You won't do it too much. You will not overdo it. So that's one secret there. Use more testimonials. Another one is that instead of targeting 5,000 people at one time, it's much better to target 1,000 people five times. It's like Sun Tzu said, and we've adopted this for business. Mastery is not doing 1,000 things five times each. It's doing five things 1,000 times each. Repetition over rain. One way that we've gotten so many testimonials is that I just, you know, shamelessly, openly, boldly, just straight out ask for them. It's a great way to do it. I have no shame in doing this. I am a whore for approval and sharing that approval with others and bragging about all our people too. I do that all the time. So here's an example using this letter, using what we've been talking about, this uh, penny model, uh, using this penny as a as kind of a t- to model after. This is something called the propaganda sandwich, and it's pretty cool. This is something that our team came up with, and since they've invented this, we've done all kinds of crazy stuff with it. I really think you're going to like this, and if you start applying it, it's really going to make a big difference in what you do. Here's the basics of how it works. So you have a group of people that are going to get three mailings, at least three mailings. First, you're going to send the original letter, right, the original piece. That is the first part of this campaign that goes out to this group of people. Then you take the replies, the clients generated, you develop some really good testimonials with them, and then you send those testimonials back 
back out to the people who did not reply. You let them know this is what you missed since my last mailing and then in the third mailing you send the original letter and all the testimonials and any new testimonials back out to everybody, the entire list. So three steps here and that propaganda gathering part where you're getting the testimonials, that's in the middle like a sandwich, get it, propaganda sandwich, that's how we came up with it. So you're going to get those testimonials from that first mailing, send them in the second mailing which will boost your response and then the third mailing everybody gets everything. They get the original piece and all the testimonials. And real estate we've done this with for sale by owners, we've done this with section 8 landlords, condemned properties, eviction notices, free and clear houses, a whole lot, basically any list you can think of. And this approach can easily make you three, five, ten times, even a hundred times or more as much money. Having a hundred times as much compliance, having a hundred times as much money. That's not an exaggeration. Let's we'll go over some campaigns in a second. You can easily make, if even if you're starting out three to five, ten times as much money immediately right out the gate just by adding this process in your mailings. One of the testimonials that we've used about process is from an exotic cars dealer. His mailing went from losing $20,000 to making him over $200,000 when he did it the right way with the list and the mailing. But then all we did to go from $20,000 to $200,000 was just get you know, to do the mailing correctly with a better piece and started making $200,000 instead of losing twenty grand, right? But when we did the sandwich, he did over $500,000 and then over $2 million. So over the course of about a year, it was less than a year, about nine months to a year, he went from instead of losing $20,000 to making over $2 million. $20,000 you're losing and making $2 million. Now, at the, the first, the losing the $20,000, it's because he really did have a great idea of what he was doing. But even when you improved it, you did what any copywriter or, or marketer, you know, savvy marketer would do, get a better list, get a better piece. Even that brought up to $200,000. That's good enough. But then when you add the sandwich in there, you're doing 10 times that, doing over $2 million. And this was all from sending mail to the same list of people. The only difference is what he was saying to them. So he was losing 20 grand, sending mail to that list of people, losing 20 grand, better copy, better piece, got made him 200,000. You can actually check his testimonial out and he explains it all, but it's basically the same list of people, just different words said to them, different dialogue. Think about that for a second. The same people they mailed to, the only difference, you know, the difference between 20 grand, losing 20 grand and making $2 million is what was said. The dialogue, the words, y'all, it's the words. And you know, it's amazing. I can give a hundred investors a list of sellers and a cell phone and at least 90 of them will come back with nothing. 90 of those investors will talk to those sellers and maybe not call them, but they'll try and they'll come back with nothing. The 10 that do come back with something will probably not close anything. Now I take that same list of sellers, right? That same newspaper and that same cell phone. I give it to Millie or Steph or Zach or somebody else on our team and they'll come back with 50 grand, 100 grand, 150 grand virtually overnight. What's the difference? It's just in the words. It's just the words, man. It's what you say. It's who you say it to and how you say it. And this little trick, the propaganda sandwich, think about that. Think about losing. Just imagine this, losing $20,000 and convinced that mail doesn't work in your business or in your area or for you or whatever. You know, my clients that buy $200,000 cars are just too fancy schmancy for a letter to work on them, right? That's the attitude, the mentality, the conclusion you would come to, right? You lost 20 grand, but then those same people, that same list, better words used with them at a better frequency, you go from losing 20 grand to making over 2 million. Okay, so now here's how to do this and how this relates to pennies and what we've been talking about today, why, why I'm using this example right now. So let's say that we mail to a group of business owners or whatever, investors, real estate people, sellers, whatever, and now we, we sent that first mail and we got our responses and we work with these people and now it's time to get those testimonials to use in the second mailing. Now, because this is going to be a lot less people than your first mailing, right? Because you're getting your testimonials, you can afford to spend more money. So in that second mailing, instead of sending them a regular mailer, we'll take the people that we did work with, the replies and the consumers, the, the testimonials from that first mailing, and we send them a second letter with two pennies attached. Or sometimes it's one penny, but two pennies attached. We've done this a lot of times with two pennies, three pennies, a quarter, a half dollar, whatever. But two pennies is good for this reason. Two pennies attached and it's see-through. And the teaser says something like, here's my two cents, now how about yours? Or or I'd love your two cents on last Tuesday, or trade me your two cents for $100,000. And then in the letter, I begin by flattering them. Flattery always works. Here's some excerpts. I'll be blunt. The best way to convince rich, smart people like you of something is to have it come from other rich, smart people like yourself. Then I explain that it costs money to send a million like this, but I'm doing it because I want their feedback so that I can use it for the next million to all the people that I send my next letter to, because I'm going to send a letter to all the people that did not respond from that first mailing. You see how it works? I mean, very transparent. I'm telling these people exactly what I'm doing. So I'm getting testimonials to use and I flat out tell them I'm going to use your name, rank, and elite status, high profile, recent success with me in my next mailing for all your peers to see. So don't be surprised if they start treating you better or worse because maybe they're too envious. In which case, please pass along my number. There's no reason anybody, especially as anybody as successful and wealthy as you, should be deprived of getting to work with me, right? I'm throwing in a little tongue in cheek. I openly tell them that I'm about to brag about them and I'm going to make them look like a genius. And this is important that they already know me so they know the deal, but they also know that I do want to brag about them. Now, later at the end of this letter, I get real 
dramatic about their testimonial. So I'll say something like, here's, uh, here's, let me pull this copy up. So here, so call me and leave me a wildly enthusiastic and highly animated voicemail. Please do it right now while this is fresh in your mind and immediately afterwards you will experience a childlike euphoric high. You and I will be holding hands, tap dancing on rainbows and juggling unicorns. Notice the action words, right? Action, action, action. Verbs over nouns or verbs over adjectives. Action words, right? You see it? I want to create that image. And that $100,000 raffle, by the way, sometimes we'd give away a house or a block of shares or something. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more than $100,000. But for the right testimonial, we'll easily, you know, we'll pay a lot for that. And I'll openly tell people that, you know what, we paid for this because they made so many, you know, I wanted to get this story out there. This is how much money it was worth for me because we had to, you know, go around some legal red tape and go into some gray area and then come back to the gray area. And I had to check with our attorneys to make sure it was okay to use this testimonial. Get really dramatic with it. Now, in cases, some industries, a lot of times, you don't ever want to pay for a testimonial outright. So the way we do it is we take our clients, we put them in a raffle, and then we you know, give them a chance to win something. So there's a lot of ways to do it. But that's how we got the testimonials. We That's one way we'd get the testimonials instead of just calling them up or people who we are don't maybe not don't have as much regular contact with. We use these pennies. So we get these, you know, we would send, we would send this mailing to get these testimonials and then we'd send those testimonials out in that next mailing. And then at the end for the third mailing, we'd send everybody who did not comply and even some of the people who did, we'd send them this package of testimonials along with that original letter. And it says, this is what you've missed out on since my first letter. Just a few weeks ago, this is what's happened. Since then, this is what you've missed out on. You know, here's all these testimonials I just got from people that you recognize, right? These people know these people. These are other doctors in their field, other real estate investors, other Wall Street types, other college professors, other linguists, piano players, whatever. You see how this works, right? One of the reasons this works really, really well is, and you know, one of the reasons it's so brilliant is because of the testimonials. It's from other people that they know. And it makes it clear that this is what you missed out on just from when you last heard from me. Don't blow your chance again. You can join these folks. You know, this is a good result they're having and you can join and be a part of the party. And sometimes people will say, why do you use those pennies to get their attention since they're already clients? This has been a, an issue sometimes people have, you know, when we've done this for other businesses. And it's just, it's amazing how many, how often, how willing people are to trip over pennies. In this case, literally, right? You want to do this because you can easily get three to five times the response from your, that second million that you got from the first when you mail out those testimonials. So you want as many testimonials as possible for that second and third mailing. So don't try to save pennies only to lose dollars. And we've tested this and we get a much higher response when we include those pennies. But if you're pressed for things, you can just thug life it and do what you can with what you've got. But this is a more ideal way to do it, to make sure you get the maximum, you know, the biggest bang for your buck. Now, let's talk about how profitable this little model can really be and how profitable it can be for real estate investors. Now, let me be clear about this. I'm on thousands and thousands. We, the people on our team, we are on thousands of lists as Confederates, okay? What that means is we work with mailing houses and we're on their list. We're the seeds on that list. So when they sell a list to an investor and they say you can only mail to this twice or once or whatever, we are the people who are being paid and often we do it for voluntarily purposes. We don't even take the money. I just want to get on the list so I can get all the pieces that the, you know, who's buying it and what are they mailing. So we get to see that stuff. We've worked with mailing companies for years and years and we're on so many lists of seeds, as plants that I'm telling you that because this little technique that I'm talking about that I'm sharing with you right now, this sandwich, the propaganda sandwich, this is something that the guys and gals on our team here have invented. Nobody was doing anything like this before they came up with it. So credit where credit's due. It wasn't my idea. It was their idea. And some people have since then adopted variations of it, but no one's doing it exactly the way that I'm outlining it for you. And in the case, if you heard from Millie or Zach's audiobook on this, they get paid routinely six figures to teach people how to do this. Now there's more, a little more to it that I'm describing right now, but I've just gone over enough for you to go out and do this, right? You get it, right? Mail out once, take the testimonials, mail out again. And those three mailings, you can do one mailing for the initial one. The second mailing just goes to the clients and then the third mailing goes to everyone. So you don't have to do that second and third mailing to everyone that didn't reply. You can just do two large mailings. And then when you buy the list, just let them know you're going to do two large mailings to everyone, but one mailing is going to go out to the clients that respond. And by the way, usually the clients are not going to be seeds. So you don't have to worry about, you know, someone saying, oh, you mailed three times instead of twice. What I'm saying is that this is pretty badass and uh, you can license this out. You can rent this out, this process out for quite a bit of money. The basic concept you understand, right? You get a list of people, you send a creative to them, a mailing piece. Then we send a second piece to the people who replied. We get those testimonials. In this case, we use two pennies and it says something like, here's my two cents. I'd love to hear yours. We get some success stories. Then we send that last, that third mailing to everybody on the list. 
It's a bigger, more expensive package, but it includes all the testimonials and the original piece. Sometimes there'll be another mailing that we'll do, second mailing out to everyone that's just all the testimonials, and then the third one with the testimonials and the piece again. You can get away with three mailings, and one of them's gonna be really cheap, because that's the one with the pennies that you're getting testimonials. But you wanna have at least two, usually three, but at least two mailings, with that, because that second one is that, that one with all the testimonials, that's the one with the punch. And that third mailing will say something like, I just emailed you know other real estate investors, other doctors, other business owners, whatever. I just emailed other people in this area in this industry a few weeks ago and I didn't hear back from you but I did hear back from some other doctors in your area since my last email or from, since my last mailing and here are just some of the success stories that they've experienced in their own words this is what you missed out on this will be your final notice your last chance at this my last uh, you know my last chance to be able to send this mailing to you this is it so it's a pretty powerful mailing and usually you get about three to five times a response rate, usually a lot more, but at least three to five times a response rate. But I just want you to see, even if you only did three to five times a response rate, what does that really mean? Again, it's the propaganda sandwich. Here are the numbers, the metrics. It's not really, you know, a sandwich, but you get the idea. It's one of the reasons it's so powerful is because, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, there's a layered approach to it. And because, and this is something that you should remember with all your copy, all your dialogue, basically anything. Remember, I mentioned this earlier, whenever you want somebody to hear, listen, and most of all, accept a positive message about you, then it is always better to have somebody else saying it. It's along the same reasons why people take a stock tip much more seriously if they overheard it or if it wasn't meant for them. The most positive things about you should come from somebody else. When you brag, it should be about others, what you've done for others. The less you've done for others, the more you have to talk about what you've done for yourself. This is why also when you have other people flattering you or other people talking about you, this is why letters from animals work so well. And I've talked about this before. Some of my best pulling letters, some of the best pieces I've ever written, not just for myself, but for others are written by uh, animals, by pets. Some of my best letters have been written by my beautiful babies, Iago and Zazu. And Iago, man, in real life, he is actually hilarious. He loves attention. And years ago, he learned, if you don't know the story, that he could get attention from me anytime by cussing. So he cusses pretty much nonstop. And not just at home either. It's gotten us kicked out of places. He's caused scenes everywhere. And, you know, a more mature person would try to correct him. But man, I just I don't know what my problem is. I just find it's just like one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And there's always kids around too when he starts up and I just I try to stop him I try to be mature but I just start laughing uncontrollably and it, then it's it's actually how we came up with the term LC he's still to this day if I don't you know if I don't get his food fast enough or if I don't play with him enough he'll just throw it out there you know and it really the way it started you know the LC the lazy C word that's what he calls me a lazy and then he says the C word <laughs> and he does it with anybody if anybody does something or says something that he doesn't like or he's moving fast enough he'll just throw it out there you lazy <laughs> and he just throws it out so it's just one of those things my point is that I know people are really offended by the C word, by the way. That's something I've learned. I mean, people are really offended by it. But you know what? Even, and that's if I say it, but everyone, if you, it may seem weird hearing it now, but if you saw him and you were around, you heard him start cussing, believe me, you'd start laughing too. Everyone does. Even kids, or even people, parents with kids. You know, it's just, it's a hilarious thing. Anyway, here's my point though. People that know us, that know me, they know how he is. So when I write a letter from him, a lot of people love it because they know it's going to be filled with profanity. And I also throw in personal insults at me, which is not a joke matter by the way when you have a letter from somebody else you know that make sure that they whenever you have a testimonial or a letter that's coming from someone else don't make it all great make sure they express their what what used to be their hesitations their objections their reservations that your target has now that they used to have bottom line is that when you say something about yourself say the bad stuff and have other people say the good stuff like i said so many people it's amazing how many people you'll meet and how many they'll start talking about how great they are and i want i mean everyone does this it's just like that does not have the effect you want it to have anytime you say something bad about yourself people immediately believe it. Just keep that in your mind and you're training them to trust you. It's like I said with my house getting raided. Nobody's ever doubted that. So if you write a letter from your pet, have them, you know, poke a little fun at you because everyone knows that you really wrote it. So they poke fun at you. It's a little, it's a good thing. Have your pet, have your animal poke a little fun at you. It's good, but you know, don't get carried away with it. Don't get crazy with it. Don't have your dog say, oh, I wish my owner would stop beating his wife. Don't, you know, just use your judgment, you know. With time, you'll get better and better and better and you'll start using this automatically. We have several versions of Yago's letter that I write out, but I make sure that people know me and they know the situation otherwise it sounds like I'm just, you know, throwing out profanity for no reason. Also, one other big secret, one of the top questions people always ask me about copywriting is how to write headlines. And one answer is that you can always use the words how to to start. A headline really is about a promise that you're making. But another great formula for headlines, another great algorithm, especially when, you know, when you're doing this, when you're using testimonials, is to use a 
as your headline the words in within the testimonial. Specifically, make the headline an objection. Take the main objection that your target has and that your testimonial also talks about and make that the headline. Put it in quotes. So it's something like, I knew it would be too expensive and too much of a nightmare to switch my billing company. That's a great headline. That's one of our best pulling pieces. Or, I was sure there was no way to buy my first home with no money and walk away from closing with cash, right? That's a headline. That's an objection. Or, I knew that there was no possible way to sell my house for 10% more than it's worth in less than two hours. That's a good one, right? And then the letter goes on to explain how this idea was invalidated and corrected by working with you. And it works because it's in their words, right? Somebody just like your target expressing an objection that your target has. So that's a good formula for a headline. Use an objection. Just take the biggest objection and put that up as your headline. Okay, so this is the sequence, the propaganda sandwich. Now let's look at how these numbers work. Let's say we have a list of a thousand people and we spend a thousand dollars mailing to them. Maybe they're sellers, maybe they're cash buyers, maybe it's not in real estate at all, maybe it's doctors, doesn't matter. Now to reply, they call, maybe they attend something, but in this case, we'll say that we send them to a website, a landing page. And on that page, they enter their name, email, phone number, and then they get a series of emails that walk them through the process to a transaction. This is your compliance curve. If you're not familiar with that, go through my class on how to hire an agent that makes you $10,000 a month, how to hire a real estate agent that makes you 10 grand a month, how a real estate investor can hire a real estate agent that makes you 10 grand a month. Go through my class on that. There's a lot of great stuff in there, but I talk about the compliance curve in depth. Now, the cool thing in real estate is that we have such a high transaction amount, such a high transaction value that you can target and make sure that you only mail to people who, if you do a deal with them, if you have a transaction with them, it'll make you at least $10,000, for example. And that would be my minimum. You know, you'd want to make no less than five to 10 grand on each deal that you do as soon as you get up and go, maybe you do less than that to get started, but as soon as possible, get your minimum up there to five to 10 grand. And these are on the low end deals. So even if you convert on your mailing at 1%, remember you're mailing to a thousand people, you spend a thousand dollars. So if you convert on your mailing at 1%, meaning that if you mail to a thousand people, you have 10 people who go to the website and opt in and then go through your curve. These are pretty high quality prospects. Now, if you convert only 10% of those people, right? So if the thousand people, 10 people went to the website, went through your curve, you know, they're getting your emails and now only 10% of those people that you convert, not more than 20%, but if you just work with 10% of those people and you make 10,000 per deal, that means that you need 10 people to make $10,000. Make sense? You need 10 people to go to the website to get your emails to, you know, 10 leads and then you've got, now you're going to make 10 grand. So 10 people equals $10,000. That means that every person that goes to your landing page is worth about $1,000. So if you spent $1,000 on that mailing to get those 10 people, then you spent $100 per lead, right? So you're spending $100 per lead and you're making $1,000 per lead. So you spent $1,000 and you make $10,000. Make sense? So for every 1,000 pieces, those are your numbers and this is from your first mailing. Now, you're going to send that second piece with the pennies, right? You're going to get the testimonials and then you're going to send that third mailing piece, which is all the testimonials and then that initial piece, right? So when it's done right, you're going to send two mailings to that large list and then one in between to get your testimonials, the propaganda stuff that you're going to get, right? And keep these numbers in mind. You're spending $100 per lead, making 1000 So you spent $1,000, you made $10,000. At this point, you've only had one client, but you can still work with other people in the future and get other testimonials. But right now, just, just follow the process here because that's the important part. So you mail that third mailing out with your testimonial, even if it's only one. But as you get better, you're going to have several and you can use several from the past as well. These are other people I've worked with just like you. Now, when this is done right, what we're seeing right now is a response rate that goes up by 5x or more. But we're not even going to use that right now. We're just going to use 3x. So you have three times the response rate on that second million, on that third million, I should say. That means from that same 1,000 people, from that same $1,000, it might be a little bit more because it's a bigger mailing that you're sending, but about $1,000, instead of 10 replies, you get 30. So the cost is not $100 per lead, but now it's about $33 per lead. Now, if you convert just at that same 10%, which it will, that will improve as well because these are higher quality people. They've also seen testimonials. But even if you don't, even if it's just 20 or 10%, not 20 or 30%, just 10%. And remember, you should do a lot better than that because these people are further along the curve. But again, you just maintain that 10%. Now you're doing three deals at $10,000 each. That's $30,000. So from that same list, your first mailing, you're paying $100 per lead at 10%. You spend $1,000 and you make $10,000. Now, one mailing later, or maybe two mailings later because you sent out that mailing with the pennies or maybe not the pennies to get your testimonials, but basically the second mailing to that same list, the next time they hear from you, your metrics go from $100 per lead to $33 per lead. And even if we maintain that same 10%, instead of making $10,000, you're making $30,000. You see what I'm saying? So you spend that same $1,000, but you make $30,000, not $10,000. You spend $1,000 the first time and you make $10,000 the first time. The second time you spend $1,000 and you make $30,000. And you know, people online are always trying to get more traffic to their site. 
with you know like free traffic or what they think is free traffic like seo or viral marketing or social media and all this other stuff but the fact is the best way to build a business especially online is through buying traffic it's much more predictable controllable and scalable so in this case once you get the right ingredients the right creative the right moving parade of a list then all you do is hit send every month or every week and you get a steady flow of leads and steady flow of transactions predictability is the key now Sunny recently worked with a student of ours Linda Payton and this is exactly what she did she went through these three mailings and she did it with the same list of investors the same list of sellers and she did it three times in less than 90 days and here are her average numbers the cost spent on all three mailings was about twenty five hundred dollars the profit from each campaign was just over thirty five hundred dollars and she did this three times so in less than 90 days the total output from her was less than $7,000 and she made just over $110,000 in less than 90 days. That's what predictability will do. Again, I want to make sure you go through that example. I just use $1,000 and $100 just to make it simple and easy to follow so I'm not using, you know, $2,400 and 19 cents or whatever. But that's exactly what she was doing. The reason she spent $2,500 on the mailing was because she mailed twice to that big list. Otherwise, it's, you know, a lot cheaper to do that. But again, spending $2,500, making $35,000 and doing that three times in 90 days. Imagine that spending less than $7,000 and making a net profit of over $110,000 in the next 90 days, all from just doing this one little, adding this little tweak to it. How many people spend $1,000 on a mailing? This is what so many people in real estate do, which by the way, I don't recommend ever spending any money. If you're starting out, do not do this. You don't need any money, any money, no money at all to put your deals together and to, to hit your 10 to 30 grand a month. You don't need any money at all. I'm just using this example right now because I mean, when you get better, you want to spend money, but it's just insane when you add this, like the, when you do the sandwich, the way that I'm talking about it, and you go out and you use these testimonials, you can go out, spend 2,500 to make 35 grand. And once you have your team handle the calls, this is how you build a business. This is how you build predictability. This is what I teach. This is what we do. This is what we train people to do. And that's why earlier when we were talking about Don and Mark with their mailings for cars, this is the exact same way they went from losing $20,000 and thinking that it doesn't work in my area, losing 20 grand. And just by using the same approach, they went from losing 20 grand to making over $2 million. And it's just from doing this and anybody can do it. Okay. So those were some of the, some examples we would tell with four closure mailings, testimonial mailings, medical mailings. Let's talk about one more really cool example. Okay. So the, the numbers were a hundred and over a hundred thousand dollars, but that was just in the 90 days. So it was uh, more than double that over the next few months. So it was more than $200,000. So spending less than seven grand and ultimately making over $200,000, but that a hundred thousand dollars, 112, whatever thousand that came in in that 90 days. So I only included that 90 days. And this is what happens when you do this correctly. You have a much higher quality lead. And you know, whenever we work with buyers or sellers or anybody, especially investors, we always try to come up with a blueprint to make money and to help them and to build a long-term relationship with regular transactions. So you get a much higher quality consumer, a much higher quality client when you do this correctly. But the numbers there was more than double that when you include the t- several months out. So less than seven grand, making over 200 grand using this. And it's this isn't, you know, we see this kind of result. We just did, uh, you know, we've done mailings with uh, absentee owners or eviction notices. And we just had another mailing we were just talking about right before we did this, where we took the same, we, we sent, we just to test the difference, we took a, a list and we sent the copy to it. We sent one mailing piece to it. Then we sent a second mailing piece. We tried it twice. So two mailings to this large list. And then we took that response. We compared it to two mailings again, but this time with that, the sandwich in the middle, right? So we sent a mailing, got the testimonials. And then for that second mailing to that large list, we sent all those testimonials and then that original mailing again. And we beat that first mailing by 16, 17 times. That's 16, 17 X. I don't mean 16, 17%, but 16 times the response rate, 16, 17 times the response rate. And for that, for that testimonial mailing, by the way, you should go through the class and testimonials on how to come up with those, even if you don't have any. And, um, you know, you don't need to have testimonials from just that group of people. And you don't have to use the pennies, although we do use the pennies because it's the reason, you know, it's uh, it's incorporated with the mailing. We do use the pennies. You don't have to, but eventually you do want to because you want as many testimonials as possible and the pennies can boost your response. Okay, so like I said, those are examples with different kinds of mailings. Let's go over one more example. And actually, you know, before that, I should, you know, um, I should really, you know, the main guy that I learned to write copy from when I first started learning this, the person that I paid the most money to basically to learn copy. Whenever I want to learn anything, I'm so grateful that a long time ago, I learned the value in finding a good teacher, the best teacher I could find. And when somebody's doing exactly what you want to do, find the best and then pay them whatever it takes with time, money, both or more, do whatever it takes. Don't be like the masses of LCs who look at the cost, focus on the return, how much you'll make. Don't think how much will this cost me? Think how much will this make me? So I found the best copywriter alive at the time and really one of the all time best, the 
single he's had the single best pieces of copy ever written and I paid him over $30,000 to train me. I won't mention his name here although I have mentioned his name uh, in the past and other places but one of the things he didn't want anyone to know that he was so cheap to hire the $30,000 and that may seem like it's expensive but it's not. I mean you, you get one piece and you make that back every month. This guy was a genius and one of his most famous letters was using a pen. He was at the top of a letter. He was a pioneer and using this uh, and you know using the penny at the top of a letter and sometimes we'd use two pennies with our testing but the way he used a penny at the top of the letter said I'm sent you this very important letter and I've attached a penny for two reasons da 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 and it went on it's a very famous letter and sometimes we use two pennies sometimes we use a penny a nickel a quarter a half dollar all kinds of cash but I did want to give a shout out to my original mentor the copywriting genius who I uh, learned from who also used a penny but all this talk of using pennies I want to give you a good example of how to use pennies to get testimonials and we went over a few other examples and since this has to do with the penny mailer we're using a penny but I know if you're starting out you may think that costs too much or you don't want to do that or you may have hesitation so before we go I wanted to give you a solid piece we've done a lot of testing and we have a solid winner I know a lot of guys don't have the time money or easily available resources to use a penny or an item or some 3d mailing so here's a high converting piece that does not require a penny to pull and I'll share that with you right now this was to raise private money for real estate and this which is the question we always get this came as a result of testing from one of the letters modeled after the two penny letter eventually we were giving away coins bigger and bigger coins and then we were able to get away with giving no pennies no coins attached and just a good T sent on the front of the envelope to the right list. This letter is the letter that Trisha used to raise over $25 million in private money and the one that Greg used to raise over $35 million in private money. And when we were paying Margaret for access to her clients, she herself made over $10 million just in providing her list, her list of clients and her endorsement, which is another secret, by the way, that when you get good copy and good pieces and you have them in your arsenal, you can go to people of influence and they can do nothing but provide an endorsement and make a good full-time income just doing that for you. She's made millions of dollars doing nothing, not lifting a finger. So here's that letter. On the, the first, I'll go over the teaser. On the outside, it read, if you have $100,000 and you're happy with your returns that you're getting on it, then please do not open this letter. So, you know, immediately everyone opens the letter, right? Okay, so you open the letter and here's what it read. Here's what you saw. Headline, last year I bought over 250 houses. This year I'll double that. If you want to make 20% of years one of my investors, then you want to be at my next lunch Saturday because I'm picking new investors. So a couple of things already. First, notice the emphasis on the words you want to be at my lunch. These are called desired commands or implicit commands. Notice I do not emphasize the word then, right? It's not then you want to be at my lunch. I just go start with the desired goal. You want to be at my lunch. So in other versions, we'll say if you want to make 20%, you want to give your undivided attention to this very important letter. And the words I emphasize are you want to give your undivided attention to this very important letter. So we take the desired thought or command that we want the target to feel or express and we emphasize that. Another example, if you want to lose 50 pounds the next 90 days, you want then you want to watch this uh, video right now. We don't emphasize the word then. We start with you you want to watch this video right now. Notice that this is not, you know, this isn't just, you know, simply a command like watch this video or be at my lunch. But we go a step further by adding personalized desire. You want to watch this video. You want to be at my lunch. And this is where, you know, this kind of testing, you can change one word, just one syllable in a letter or an ad and, you know, increase the result by 10x. Turn a loser to a massive winner. Remember, losing 20 grand and making over $2 million. It's just the words. And in general, you usually don't want to use the words I or my, and instead you want to constantly use the word you because you're talking to the reader but in this case it is important that the target knows that the author is a real person and yes you know I myself will be at the lunch and this letter is from me to you so when Trisha or others do it or whoever's doing it we use the exact same concept we just change the signature and third and which is also really important is the word picking and notice I'm only talking about the headline so far but I'm breaking this apart so you guys can get the most out of this the word here that I use is picking this makes it clear that there's one of me and many of them it helps in positioning and framing and really can then build a bridge to you okay so then the open is Warren Buff here's the open to the letter. Warren Buffett's closest friends and family have said that his biggest asset is his patience. Buffett took $100,000 and 20% a year on it for 40 years. The result was about $40 billion. You and I have ways to go to catch up to him, but dot, dot, dot. And then I explained that the 20% is actually attainable. Now, in this case, we don't open with a famous quote, like, you know, the letter with if thou hast two pennies, but we do open with a famous example, which can serve the same purpose and be just as effective. And then here's another excerpt from the letter. I can't guarantee you 40%, but I can confidently and boldly perhaps guarantee you something else 20% annualized return on your money yeah right you might say leaning back crossing your arms and squinting your eyes I can understand that response and even if you don't feel skeptical now you would be if I told you how much above that 20% I'm getting for my clients and investors you want proof right now I'll stop there for a second and point out this little algorithm that I've used this to teach and train a lot of copywriters and we've used it again and again and if you know my stuff you you picked up on it immediately so this works really really well so if you know anything about how we invest and use private money the real number the most basic goal that we try to get 
uh, we, you know, from a beginning amount is we try to get about 30 to 40 percent annualized. Now that's way above that 20 percent that I mentioned, but I know that the 20 percent sounds crazy, right? Especially to a lot of these people. So the formula here, the algorithm you use is you mention something a little crazy, but then right after that, I suggest or I allude to something even crazier and even more unbelievable. And then whenever you do that, the next words out of your mouth better include the word proof because that's what everybody wants to know. So always be thinking, always keep that in your mind. Make a, you know, have a claim that's crazy, but then allude or, you know, suggest, hint at an even crazier claim, but then immediately hit him with proof. And if nothing else, just talk about the proof you're going to show him. Whenever you make a claim, always picture somebody sitting there saying BS, 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 you know, kind of heckling you. Always, you always have to have proof. And that's something that, again, testimonials help with. In this case, they're going to come into the lunch and see it for themselves. But the takeaway here in the copy is to mention something crazy, allude to something much crazier, much greater, much more unbelievable, and then immediately hit him with proof. Because the mental process somebody goes through is, yeah, maybe 20%. I don't know. That's kind of weird. Maybe that's crazy. You know, they're right there when they hear that 20%, that's where they're at mentally. So 20% is kind of crazy, but what's he mean that he can consistently do a lot better than that? What's behind that door? It makes your target feel like they're missing out on a world of opportunity. And all it takes to get into that world is come into this free lunch. And by the way, that does, you know, in this case happen to be true, which more than helps, you know, you want to make sure your stuff is true. Don't just start throwing claims out there. But you know, also coming back to that constant BS voice, you always want to hear that whenever you're writing copy. Look at how I describe the reaction. Yeah, right. Like, yeah, right. BS. You're full of it. Like, that's the attitude you want to have. You're full of it. What are you laughing about, Randall? You're full of it. Take a hike. Take a hike. Yeah, we're going back to 80s insults, you know. Don't make me give you a knuckle sandwich. That's what you want. Think about that, like, rowdy guy from the 80s movies. Whenever you quote your prospect, whenever you quote your target, make it, purposely make it confrontational. Notice I use that word, yeah, right. A lot of copywriters, a lot of people that write stuff are afraid to put objections or kind of a confrontational tone. But do that all the time. Always assign a confrontational tone to your reader. Whenever they have an objection or anything and they express it in a confrontational tone, it does help. Something like, BS, Oz, and that's not true. How could that be true? What are you talking about? Because whenever you voice an objection of your target, make that voice in the meanest, nastiest, most standoffish way possible. Just like I was saying earlier about testimonials and having them first express an objection and then, you know, often using that objection as your headline. You want to have and continue the conversation that your target is already having going, already has, you know, going on in their head. And it's even better when you express objections in a nasty, confrontational tone like, BS, yeah, right. Make your target think, you know, that you want them to think in their head, well, you know, I don't feel that strongly. I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't that mad about it. I'm not the call in BS. Like, I'm not that, you know, adamant about it. But since you brought it up, what is your reply to that? That's what you want them thinking. Because when you express that nasty tone, that's not going to be the tone your prospect has probably, but they're going to want to hear your response to that. And it helps them understand that you're going to constantly play devil's advocate. I'll tell you, you take any letter, any communication, any dialogue you have, the better that you express objections that your targets have, the better you're going to be overall. And I'm not even talking about, even if I don't even see the responses to the objections, just the fact that they're savvy enough to have come up with them. It shows that their head's in the right place. And then notice the words that I use right after that, the visuals that we conjure up here. Yeah, right. You say leaning back, crossing your arms and squinting your eyes. Notice the action words here, the imagery, right? Leaning, crossing, squinting. It makes it impossible not to picture this. Verbs over adjectives. The more images you create in your writing, the better off you are. And especially over the phone when you're talking to someone. It's a form of mind control. When you write like this, always think about verbs and nouns. Nouns and verbs. Verbs and nouns. Nouns and verbs. Not adjectives so much, but verbs and nouns. Verb is an action and noun is a person, place, or thing. When you use them together, it's nearly impossible for people to not picture what you're saying in their head. And that's what you want. This mind control. Make them see it. Seeing is believing. And then later on in this letter, I touch on another universal truth about every human being on the planet, but especially investors. Everybody wants to feel like an insider. And the thing about insiders, what defines them really is that they know other insiders. Everybody wants to be asked this question and answer this question with the, you know, these magical four words. Yes, everybody, even you, everyone, every investor you'll ever talk to. We all want to be asked how, how, how did you do that? How are you doing this? How did you pull that off? It's like a magic trick. I used to be really into that stuff and I still have a couple things, a couple tricks up my sleeve because kids and adults are just so mesmerized by magic and doing, you know, magic tricks and stuff like that. And it's such a great feeling to hear people ask, how'd you do that? How does that work? And the amazing thing is that a surprisingly large part of you, if you start doing these tricks, actually wants to tell the people. You want you want to tell people. It's in all of us. You want to tell the people how you did it. Investors are the same way, especially the ones with lots of money. They want to hear things like, how do you get such a crazy deal on your house? How do you get such crazy deals on your car? How do you get such a crazy return on your investment? They want to hear the question, how? How are you getting those crazy returns in real estate? That's what they all want to hear. They love it. And I'm giving them that gift of getting those questions, but but also I'm giving them the second part of that wish, which is the answer. We all want to answer that question.
question with those four marvelous words. We want to casually say, you know what we want to say? Where are we at, Randall? What do we want to say? You know what we want to say. We want, what does every human being on the planet want to say to that question? Randall asked me if I could get a boat big enough to hold two of every animal on earth. What's the answer, Randall? What did I say? I know a guy. Come on, Randall. Come on. I know a guy. That's what people want to say. Whenever they're asked how, how are you doing this? How are you getting these crazy deals on your real estate? They all want to say, I know a guy. So this, we were giving these people, you know, these investors a chance to be insiders. It's a great gift you're giving them. Don't underestimate the emotional pull that has. And then we have the signature and I'll cover this real quickly. When we leave this off the version. We usually use a actually write in, you know, you can have companies that like bond.co that'll actually take your hand, write it and add it to letters. You should do that. You want to have, don't just use a font that's like, that looks like handwriting. Actually try to handwrite as many letters as possible or handwrite it and then copy it. We try to hand sign. And you know, then when you hand sign it, by the way, also handwrite the number on there or the website. And then beneath that, write the command again. Any handwriting on a type letter will get the immediate attention, right? It's just like the, uh, what the, the captions underneath pictures, handwriting always gets immediate attention too. And we tested this. So you don't need to put the number twice. You can just put it one time. That's a call to action. The number or the website in handwriting at the bottom there beneath the name. And all we do is change the name of the person who's sending it out and who's doing the lunch, obviously. So the letter sign, the call to action is having them call me to reserve their seat. And when others use it, we just have, we just change the name and then they call them, whether it's Trisha, Sam or whoever. And that's really the only change because they're all buying houses with me and maybe we change our numbers. The number is actually much higher or lower depending on who it is, but we make sure it's accurate. And then when Margaret or others would mail this their clients, they'd get a share in the money that we made, the money that we raised. So it's been a pretty powerful little letter. The actual money raised, by the way, you guys know was well over the 25 or 27 million. I said it's well over twice that actually. And this is the same, you know, others have used this exact same approach to raise money for real estate, all sorts of companies and deals like bridge financing, IPOs, a whole bunch of mother grabbers have made all kinds of money doing the same exact thing using the same letter. And you don't need to buy a fancy list. Just start working with people. And as soon as you start working with people like Margaret or money managers, money people, money market, you know, moving people and people that are making things happen. And, you know, as you get better and better, you can just go to their internal clients, just do JVs. It's a free mailing at that point. I wouldn't recommend it, especially if you're starting out. Do not do the starting out, but it is a good letter. Do not pay for a mailing starting out, but it's a good letter, a good way to raise money. Let me put it this way. You could use, would you agree with this? You could use just this letter and you don't need any money to do deals anyway, but if you're in that world where you want to for commercial or whatever, or for bridge financing deals, this letter, you could use just this letter and never need anything else to raise all the money you need, correct? We've had people build companies at 30, 40, 50, $100 million using just this letter or using the money that we made that, that has been raised from this letter and actually a lot less than the money raised from this letter. So this is a pretty powerful piece. That's my point. Margaret's uh, take and hit from this, like I said, has been over $10 million. I mean, when we recorded her testimonial, which is another secret, by the way, use a testimonial about the person who's using, you know, who's sent, sending for you. So you can use that with the next person. So you can go to just these few people and have like a secret underground campaign going on that nobody ever knows about, because no matter what list you're on as a seed, nobody will know that you're sending out this piece. It'll be like you're doing this like secret underground thing that no one ever knows about because you're going to individuals and who have influence with high net worth individuals and then they're promoting you to those people to their clients and you only need a handful of people I mean I would even send this if you're talking about 50 100 200 people I mean it's not that many and they can get those addresses just off of Facebook you know it's crazy but as you build your fan base and you build better relationships with better people with better clients then you can get paid for you know just introducing them to each other and them doing that for you in Margaret's case the only thing she did was mail the letter and that's it she didn't even need to be at the lunch it was an easy way for her to pocket over $10 million. Okay, so this class is a lot longer than I thought it would be. But just to recap on the highlights, today we talked about a brilliant letter and some of the elements that made it work. Reader's Digest was able to go from nose diving to and losing over 4 million subscribers to more than tripling their subscriber base, going from about 4 million to over 12 million based on Walter's work. Remember how to use a token or an item in your mailing. Keep in mind the rules of mentioning it and the other points that we talked about. A famous quote or a famous example. Use a token as part of the reply. Using verbs and words that create strong visuals. Verbs over adjectives. And remember to use testimonials that work like crack. Always get them, always use them. Most importantly, always create them. Love your people and make it obvious how much you care about them. Take this for example, take this quick little video here that we've made, this little class that we made here. Who else is gonna do this for you? Just me, it should be obvious how much I love you guys. What a guy Ozem is, right, right? I know, I know, and I just, I spoil you guys rotten and you should be leaving me testimonials. And if you already have, do it again. The more the better. Also, we covered how to use objections as headlines, especially when it's a testimonial. Take that objection and put it up as your testimonial you know, the headline of your testimonial of that letter. We talked about the propaganda sandwich, the algorithm with the crazy claim, crazy claim, and then hit them with the proof. Using a token or an item like a penny in your mailings for cash buyers, foreclosures, also for testimonials. The basic dialogue structure to create images and emotion with verbs and nouns and what it means to have compliance and the difference it can make in your gaining compliance ability. Also implicit commands and highlighting them in your copy. How to open
open your messages, you know, different formats with opening your messages and making sure you get maximum impact, turning $1,000 into $10,000 and then taking that same $1,000 with the same list and turning it into over $30,000. Remember we talked about Lisa earlier, took $2,500, made over $35,000. $2,500 into $35,000, doing it three times in less than 90 days, took less than seven grand and made over $100,000. And without doing any more marketing, at least just working those same people, working with those same clients, that same consumer base, over $200,000. Less than seven grand into over $200,000. Taking mailings, imagine you buy a list, you send them two letters, two campaigns, two mailings. You get X response. Then you send them a mailing, do the propaganda sandwich and send them another mailing. So two mailings again to that big list. And you know, in the first campaign you sent two mailings, the second time you did the same thing, two mailings. The only difference is that second mailing had a package of testimonials that you got since the first mailing. You do that and you get a 16, 17 X response, 16, 17 times as much money. It's crazy. We went over all that and how that works and a lot more like the $27 million letter. And it's actually a lot more than that. And the lessons from that make, you know, breaking down that headline and that copy, making sure that you have a gatekeeper like Margaret who can make $10 million because no matter who you are or where you are in your business, all it takes is one person, just one person, just one introduction, you know, just that one person and the introductions and doors that they can open for you. Just one person can totally change your life. And I have a whole nother class where I talk about how to identify those people and how to work with them. But that's just, you know, just, you know, we won't get into that right now. And we went over a whole lot more deeper into this stuff. And I just, I want to make sure I know a lot of this stuff is just the tip of the iceberg on how deep you can go with this stuff. But I just want to make sure you're clear on the steps and the things you can do right now. Don't go out there. You don't have to go out there guessing and just thug life in it and just hoping something happens. Get yourself trained. And if you don't have the money, then use this stuff to get up there to move yourself up, to get on up, right? Randall, move yourself up. Income ascension. Also, by the way, elsewhere, I've covered how to do mailings like this with no money out of pocket. So you don't need any money to get started. So if you don't have uh, money to use for your mailings, let alone for the pennies, I never recommend getting started with money. You always do it without money. I always recommend getting your first models to go in with absolutely no money. That's why we go over so much in these classes. I want to make sure you guys are good and taken care of and able to go out there and start stacking all kinds of G's. This was just to show you how far you can take this one concept. You know, this one idea. Brilliance is everywhere. You can take this with you, apply it repeatedly and apply the brilliance. Also, Walter passed away in 1996, I believe. So please spare a thought and a prayer for him and his loved ones. Gone but not forgotten. May the brilliance live on. Also, if you want a copy of that letter, that $27 million letter, send me a testimonial, make a video or leave me a voicemail, make it a beautiful testimonial that goes over the top, just way over the top and explains to a total stranger what they're missing out on. Make sure you're holding hands, tap dancing on a rainbow and juggling unicorns during your recording. Make it brilliant, beautiful and emotional. Be a little nuts about it. Send me a good review or testimonial and I'll send you the exact same $27 million letter in a few ways that you can use it. Even if you're starting from zero with no money, how to get that deployed for you for free. Even if you don't have any deals going right now, think about that. I'm training you a video or a voice mail for $27 million. Holy moly, am I bonkers or what? No, I just love you guys that much. All right, guys, if you don't get emails from me, go to captainbad.com and make sure you're getting emails from me. They're brilliant and amazing. Kind of, I don't know, I'm a little biased, but go to captainbad.com and you'll love it. I promise. If you don't, I'm sorry. If you've listened this much, you're going to love it. If you like this, you're going to love it. Captainbad.com will send you a whole bunch of classes just like today. You're going to get really cool stuff from me. There's all sorts of classes about how to get into real estate and how to, you know, how to get into real estate. No money down, no credit checks is making 10 to 30 grand a month on each deal that you do all that stuff but it's also about getting into business and buying businesses the same way you also get the most important comprehensive summary of all the lessons i've learned it's in one big class called the sa class you definitely want to check that out and i'll tell you if that doesn't change your life or change the way you look at things then you have no soul it's great stuff i think you're really gonna like it i get great feedback from it you're gonna love it i promise so go to captainbad.com and get immersed in our stuff and really you know just see the world through our eyes if you love it you can go deeper if you don't well uh you know you'll come around right also the other classes that i mentioned here today like the science class the seller financing class the real estate basics and leverage class the class on compliance all those other ones that i mentioned you want to make sure you go through those as well if you have problems finding them just send me an email let me know and i'll make sure you get it but for right now just go to captain bad if you're not getting emails from me captainbad.com i'll see you there all right guys thank you so much for all the support and everything you guys are awesome i love you until next time take care thank you so much thanks everyone thanks guys we'll talk soon thanks